Good evening. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2015 Berkman Center kickoff. My name is Kate Darling. I'm a fellow at the center, and I'm here to introduce our director. <clears throat> Jonathan Zittrain was not born in Brooklyn, New York. He did not publish a memoir in 2010, and he was also not ranked as the 88th greatest artist of all time by Rolling Stone, or as the fourth top rapper behind Eminem, Nelly, and 50 Cent. <laughs> and he did not marry American R&B singer Beyonce in 2008. But he is also known as Jay-Z. He actually owns Jay-Z.org, and Jay-Z.com does not even exist. <laughs> And for those of you who don't know the other Jay-Z I was talking about, you've been in Cambridge for too long. <laughs> but in all honesty, if I had to choose tonight between hearing one or the other Jay-Z, I would choose this one every time. <laughs> it's true, it's true. He's way cooler. This guy was a sysop on CompuServe in the 80s. And if you think he looks a little bit too young for that, it's because he was 12 years old at the time. <laughs> he has degrees in cognitive science and artificial intelligence, public administration, and law. And now he's the George Bemis Professor of International Law at both Harvard Law School and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's also a professor of computer science at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And he's the vice dean for library and information resources which means he basically runs the Harvard Law School library. So take that, Beyonce. <laughs> He's been a really prominent voice on internet censorship and control of digital content, on privacy, digital intermediaries, and a bunch of other topics that are really kind of at the heart of what Berkman does. And he also wrote, among other things, the groundbreaking book, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. Please welcome the co-founder and director of the Berkman Center, Jonathan Citrin. Um, thank you very much, Kate, for that introduction. I, I don't think I've ever had an introduction quite like that. That's very exciting. Have you ever made the Jay-Z joke before? Uh, not in that way, yeah. So, and not saying they would prefer. My ticket prices are significantly lower, too, so it's really a bargain to come hear me talk. Um, and there's food afterwards as well. How many Jay-Z concerts have a reception afterwards? Uh, so we're really coming out ahead. Oh, really? <laughs> All of them? There's a reception after a Jay-Z? I see. Wow. Well, who knew? <laughs> Susan Crawford, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so uh, welcome. I'm uh, so happy to be here. I love kind of the first day of school. It never gets old. It just sort of repeats. And uh, that's very exciting. Thank you all for coming to our kind of science fair format next door and for this opener. I wanted to give a little bit of what Charlie Ness and our founder would call uh, ethos, logos, and then pathos. Um, but I think he got it from someone else. I'm not sure where those uh, tools of rhetoric came from. Um, but uh, to tell you a little bit about where we came from, which now was a long time ago, uh, and the internet maybe was a little bit different then. So uh, back in 1997, we had the idea of starting a Center for Internet and Society at a time when it was dodgy to call something an Internet and Society Center. Those who were hedging their bets would call them centers on law and technology, just in case this Internet thing didn't go anywhere. But we placed a bet on it. And uh, being at Harvard, it's one of those weird things about being at Harvard. We started an Internet Center, and the New York Times was like, that's a story. So it's like, people start an Internet Center, want to talk about Internet. And, um, <laughs> There we are, looking kind of awful. Um, <laughs> although I will say Charlie looks exactly the same, and I believe is wearing the same shirt that he was wearing in that photo. So <laughs> the more things change, the more they stay the same. And there's Larry Lessig uh, before he ran for president, and uh, <laughs> makes us look like chopped liver, really. What have we done lately? And there's Cindy Cohn, actually, who went on uh, to now become the executive director of the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation. So, yeah, very exciting. And uh, 
This was a day when just like showing up was enough to be like, yes, news, people are studying the internet. And it's gotten more complicated since then. At the time, though, uh, one of the things we found ourselves most fascinated by was that the internet does have a kind of form of collective hallucination to it. It is not a service offered by Internet Inc. for which if you are displeased with your internet experience, you can call the CEO of the internet and demand that he or she be replaced or answer to you. Um, it looks like Samantha Bates, a research associate extraordinaire at the Berkman Center, is surfing now to show the current homepage of the Internet Engineering Task Force, because my example was from about 1998. As you can see, the homepage still screams 1994 at you. <laughs> That's an intentional thing to kind of put you to sleep a little bit. It's like soporific, nothing to see here, folks. We're just the plumbing of the internet. Although, I do wonder if you chat live with the IETF community, what will happen? <laughs> I just think, it's like, Sam is going to click on it, and they can be like, we have a live one. Um, oh, do nothing, do nothing, sorry. So, um, uh, the IETF is kind of weird because uh, we found out, especially as lawyers, it was interesting to us. It's not incorporated. It has no CEO. There's no place for service of process. And in fact, if you jump back to my slides, you'll see, uh, let's see, yep, uh, the uh, participating in the efforts of the IETF, it's not a membership organization, no cards, no dues, no secret handshakes, smiley face. <laughs> And I think a missing external parenthesis that's going to bother me for the rest of this slide. Um, <laughs> but integrity, we need to leave it the way it was misdone. Uh, it's data compression. That's a little lossy, though, by my lights. Uh, anyway, it's a large, open, international community of network designers here to ensure the smooth operation of the internet. It's open to any interested individual. This is a weird way to design, run, evolve a network, to have people show up. And I don't know, how many people consider themselves, though there are no members, IETF members? How many IETFers do we have here? OK, not enough for a quorum, if quorums were needed for a meeting. Uh, but the kinds of folks that uh, try to reach rough consensus and running code on protocols for a network that if everybody were more or less to follow them, although you don't have to, you would end up with bits that can be routed from any person to any other person. And once that happens, anybody can join the internet. And it's that open invitation, done without filtering or gatekeeping, that has been the cause of so much of the innovation and the cause, of course, of so many of the problems that have been identified, especially by lawyer types, of uh, hassle and pathos on uh, the internet. And whether or not this model will continue to be the way global networking works, I think is very much an open question. We don't assume this is always the way it's going to be. But at the time, in 97, 98, this was a fascinating and non-obvious way to design a global network at a time when CompuServe was actually still running quite strong. So uh, we then found ourselves sort of in the middle of things a little bit when Larry Lessig, one of our original triumvirate, uh, was summoned by uh, Judge Thomas Penfield Jackson from if you ask Central Casting to send you a judge, they would send you T.P. Jackson. He like smoked a pipe and had a shock of white hair and was an incredibly scary man. Um, and uh, he was, oops, I'm uh, about to get a picture of him from Samantha. Yeah, go ahead, let's, let's see T.P. Jackson. Oops, maybe Thomas Penfield Jackson. <laughs> Come on, Google, you're letting us down. Thomas <laughs> Stonewall Jackson. See, that's intimidating. Yeah, there he is. There he is. That's like, that's the usual expression he had. <laughs> Thomas Penfield Jackson is not impressed. And um, he was the Kayla McCrony? What's her name? The one who's not impressed. Michaela somebody? Come on. Thank you. He's the Michaela Maroney of the internet at the time, because he uh, beheld the uh, monopolist at the time, Microsoft, and uh, took on this case and actually got quite upset at Microsoft, but also thought that the case was really complicated and he didn't feel equipped to deal with it on his own. And so uh, he asked Larry Lessig to serve as special master in the case. 
Now, normally a special master is somebody uh, who does the work the judge just doesn't want to do. It's like you're having to tote up the contents of a schooner. So it's like time for a special master and have that person walk through and see what all of the um, various bales of wheat weigh on your schooner in 1792 where there's a dispute over it. Um, But he was just like, uh, let's have you decide the case, Larry. I read your book and it was very good. And Larry was like, done. And so we set up an office in Griswold Hall. Uh, I was his law clerk, Larry's that is. Um, to try to decide the Microsoft case, which, as Sam is showing, Microsoft was none too happy about, um, and they wanted to have Larry removed from the case, and they said he was terribly biased. Uh, Judge Jackson was not impressed. Uh, It went up to the D.C. Circuit on a writ of mandamus, asking for emergency relief that Larry Lessig be removed from the case, and uh, the D.C. Circuit granted the writ of mandamus. So despite... Uh, the excitement here uh, about Larry Lessig's appointment, he was uh, thrown off of the case, not because he was biased, but because it turns out, for those of you who are law students, uh, if you're going to have a federal case, you are owed, through your taxpayer money and basic fairness, a federal judge who's been approved by the Senate and nominated by the president to hear your case, not a law professor that the judge asks to hear it for him. I don't know why that should be the case, but it turns out it was an Article Three issue, as they say. Uh, but it was wonderful to have really delved into this case that at the time was thought of as almost the case of the century. There was another case going on around that time as well that was not internet related. And uh, after uh, he and therefore we got thrown off the case, we at least decided we could turn it into a seminar. So he did a seminar on the Microsoft case where we read the transcripts and pretended that we were still the special masters and deciding the case um, with the students. So uh, an example, though, that this stuff was confusing, it was uh, disputed, and a sense of moment at the time that uh, had us say, boy, we could actually make a difference. And that, I think, in part led us as the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998 was passed, retroactively extending the term of copyright by 20 years for nearly every copyright in America, thereby preventing um, Steamboat Willie, the first Mickey Mouse cartoon, from entering the public domain and Cineplexes doing 3D Steamboat Willie without having to pay uh, Disney for the privilege, uh, the Sonny Bono Act kept copyrights going, and uh, we were just sitting around one day and being like, you know, somebody should do something about that. So uh, we actually uh, worked with a couple would-be plaintiffs who wanted to re-key in works as they entered the public domain and have them come about uh, for free, and we brought a suit saying it was unconstitutional. It challenges actually the enumerated powers in which copyright is to be for limited times in the United States to keep retroactively uh, extending it. This chart shows you uh, the retroactive extensions and how copyright is getting longer and longer with this helpful dotted line showing projected expiration as it's going to go. uh, And in fact, 20 years now, 2018 will be an attempt, no doubt, to renew copyrights retroactively even further, which might mean that some of you have a chance to work on Eldred II, the tired retread, but somebody has to do it case that we brought. So uh, we lost in the district uh, court in record time. It was like about a week before we were told we had lost, and there was no need for hearing. And uh, we appealed to the DC Circuit, where we lost. We appealed for rehearing in the DC Circuit, which we lost. And we petitioned the Supreme Court to hear the case. And to everybody's shock, the Supreme Court agreed to hear our case which had uh, the content industry sort of going OMG, uh, if this gets reversed, could all of those retroactive extensions that had been on that chart all collapse like dominoes, leaving the length of copyright retroactively to 14 years? Uh, Wouldn't that be catastrophically fun? Um, So uh, we argued Eldred versus Ashcroft in front of the Supreme Court. And uh, after that, we lost seven to two, and the state of the law afterwards was worse than where we had found it. Um, but that was okay. It was a lot of fun, and uh, you can see a wonderful 1994 website uh, with all of the documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, then 
during the case, we got this idea of something called copyrights commons, that we ought to have something like a counter copyright, a CC instead of a C, on your work to indicate that you wanted to share it. Because it turned out that there was, after uh, the various um, Bern uh, Treaty Amendments uh, of 1976, there was no obvious way to say that you wanted to give a work to the public domain. We actually asked lawyers, like real lawyers, not law professors, like if I had a document I wanted to put into the public domain, what magic words would I put at the bottom of it? They're like, we have no idea. No one has ever asked us that before. And that's really weird. Uh, so we got this idea of counter copyright, and that became Creative Commons. This is the first 1994 style website for uh, Creative Commons saying that there ought to be a big library of stuff that people have voluntarily chosen to waive what rights they might otherwise have. This is now the Creative Commons website, which is looking much more modern. And uh, this is one of the signal achievements of Larry's work and others at the Berkman Center, some of whom are in the audience today, of shepherding this project through from just an idea that somebody had in Pound Hall to now, uh, if you jump back to my slides, you will see uh, uh, these are the licenses now. And uh, among the CC licenses, by 2006, there were 50 million of them. By 2014, almost a billion Creative Commons licenses, many of them automatically facilitated by platforms like Flickr that let you opt in. And then as you do one photo after another, say that you want to be able to share it widely, and then others can make great hay out of it. So uh, this is one example of just being able to say, all right, there's an invitation to build here. Let's build something and see what happens. And my hypothesis is those invitations still exist. It feels crowded. It feels like it's not 2006 anymore. But that's not true. There's still an open internet and web and enough uh, conflict over what the norms and standards and laws and practices should be that every single person in this room with interest in having an impact on the way this digital system works has a chance to affect its future, for which that is just not true about as true or as easy in energy policy, in criminal justice policy, in other areas where we might desperately want or seek reform. But it just doesn't have this kind of uh, easy access. Back in uh, 2000, again, uh, the Internet Corporation for a Sign Named in Numbers were formed. I will not go into that entire story here, but it is a fascinating and rarely told story that someday we will talk about. Um, and I think Sam is about to go hunting for something I can related just to tempt me into telling some part of the story, but I'm not going to do it. Um, the homepage is still going to be pretty boring. It's going to be, oh, that's the Wikipedia page, which is even more boring. Um, but it was founded in... Uh, uh, its very first meeting was down the street in Kendall Square. And again, people from the Berkman Center had a huge hand in forming it. Uh, and in what we saw at the time, I think wrongly, but at the time, I saw as a constitutional convention for cyberspace, which got the constitutional lawyer types really excited. And when it turned out not to be a constitutional convention for cyberspace, Larry kept that in mind and later was like, let's hold another constitutional convention. He really wants to hold a constitutional convention. And uh, he may yet... Uh, do that. So we ended up very involved in the governance questions around ICANN, including the mechanics of how to have a meeting that is going to be quite sparsely attended wherever it's physically located, here in Yokohama. But there could be tens of people still interested around the world <laughs> in participating. And that was good, because in 2000, streaming technology isn't what it was, uh, what it is today. I should alert you, by the way, we're streaming this live probably to tens of people. So hello out there, anyone in Yokohama uh, who's listening to us. But working on those technologies was another way in which mixing praxis and uh, norm and uh, what Kendra Albert actually is just studying as predictive um, and prescriptive technologies, uh, we figured that should be something coming from uh, a research center and one uh, with .org mindset rather than .com. This is actually part of our dashboard where you could watch Mike Roberts, president of ICANN, uh, speaking. And uh, remember the real player? Those were good times, <laughs> very good times. Um, and of course, today, it's now uh, caught the attention of more than tens of people. And Urs Gasser, our uh, executive director, has been uh, working hard uh, with organizations like the World Economic Forum, who discovered the internet about two years ago. We're like, this is really exciting. 
hello, everybody in Geneva, um, <laughs> and uh, to help them figure out how to take the vast network that they're tapped into and have them productively contributing to the collective hallucination of the internet rather than trying to do a winner-take-all uh, kind of thing. So yeah, there's their new initiative on internet governance that was started uh, for which uh, it already hit wonderfully interesting challenges as it got going. But as you can see, it was just last year that organizations of this sort have taken it up. Um, I think in some important respects, at least individually, we think of ourselves as kind of the Loraxes who speak for the trees, which always yields the risk of self-righteousness. But we find ourselves corrected early and often by the internet masses. So uh, we're not at risk of thinking that we're um, doing great things uh, if indeed we're, we're not. Another great project that started at the Berkman Center, Global Voices Online, which was the idea that these blogs might be taking off and uh, they should be taking off around the world, not just in places that were already decently wired or had uh, good internet uh, connectivity and citizen uh, connection with it. And Global Voices turned out to spin out then and there are a number of Global Voices bloggers still working uh, today. Sam's gonna go visit Global Voices now and see what it looks like. I didn't check to see, yeah, there it is. Excellent. And um, you can see it's a 2015 website that immediately interrupts you and importunes you. Uh, but this is a great example of a chance to hear from people around the world who otherwise might not have uh, the venue to do so. Let's see if you can jump back. And uh, we actually had the first broad-based blog site. Dave Weiner and some others who were really into blogging when it first got going uh, started blogs.law.harvard.edu. I love this, here's a demo of a picture. I'm going to put the picture into the page. Isn't that cool? So 2003, doesn't seem that long ago to many of us, but there's a picture in a page, and of course, it's snowing in Boston, which is pretty much par for the course in February of 2003. And there are some folks here who have, I think I saw Phil Greenspan, you're here, right? Did I see Phil? Phil, you do blogs.law. I think you're responsible for probably 90% of the hits to blogs.law, actually, so a walking example of Zip's Law in action. And uh, Doc Searles, also on blogs.law, for which we're now trying to figure out, why are we running a blog server in 2015? <laughs> why aren't you guys on Blogger? So, um, this is better. Yeah, so we may well be foisting you on someone else at some point, but it's a great example of uh, something that we sort of leap into early on, and uh, sometimes success is becoming normal and just usual rather than uh, something rare and unusual. Um, of course, serving uh, the internet can result in uh, still inscrutable errors like this socket error, remote network unreachable. And around 1999-2000, uh, I had heard rumor that there were a lot of sites you couldn't get to if you were in China. And others heard the same rumor, and I'm like, you know, there are like 1.5 billion people over there. Can't we just ask one of them? Somebody actually got a major foundation grant to fly to China, go to a cyber cafe, <laughs> ask for a few sites, take some notes, and leave. And I was like, that's, that's research. So um, we got the idea of dialing an international long distance call from Griswold Hall as if we were traveling to like a hotel in Beijing and calling the IBM net access point in Beijing and then asking for one website after another to see what was uh, uh, filtered in a more rigorous way. And we generated the first definitive list of things that were filtered in China as a result in a six week exploratory project that was uh, quite tragically ended when the phone bill came to the dean. <laughs> it was like, this is not cool. And uh, that was the end of that. But um, we went to other uh, methods to try to do it and generated uh, by 2002 some of the first tests of what was filtered in China and then compared it with other countries. It turns out that Baptist churches at the time were the most filtered things in the world. Like the Saudis and the Chinese don't agree on much, but Baptist churches have got to go is a common tenant between them. And those are the sorts of many things that jump out when you do this. This kind of research then became the uh, OpenNet initiative, which was a joint effort to track the evolving ways in which censorship was taking place. These are uh, Jingjing and Cha Cha, the internet police of the city of Shenzhen. Um, you should all strictly limit your own behavior on the web, and together we will have harmonious uh, 
a healthy internet environment and maintain harmonious internet or, uh, order, see you often, which is a very ambiguous statement from uh, Jing Jing and Cha Cha. I don't know, Sam, what you were about to search for, but uh, there they are. And uh, we ended up writing this up in a book called Access Denied with um, a cover. And uh, uh, that became uh, part of a three-part series of filtering taking place around the world, shepherded by Rob Ferris, our research director uh, who was here, and many others, to really try to figure out for the benefit of fellow scholars, for journalists, for others, what's going on as this any point to any point communication thing around the world uh, is happening and where you can't get it. I think, uh, yeah, here are some examples of the maps we came up with uh, of filtering uh, out of the open net initiative. And if you jump back to my slides, I can show a kind of time sequence. Uh, this is one of our reports in 2007 in the uh, best Zimbabwe news site on the World Wide Web, NewZimbabwe.com. They reported that Zimbabwe has been given the all clear in a survey of countries which censor the internet. So this is our uh, organization that released the study. Zimbabwe getting the all clear because topping the list was Azerbaijan followed by Bahrain. China was fourth, while Ethiopia made an entry on fifth. Are you getting a sense of the ordering of the list that might not be by prevalence of filtering? It included Libya, Morocco, Sudan, and Tunisia, and Zimbabwe came out last. Zimbabwe came out last, with Azerbaijan coming first. That's right, it was alphabetical. So um, that was uh, too bad. But the uh, other kinds of things that we discovered were um, filtering upon filtering. So among the ventures run by the US government at the time were to make sure that Iranians could get to sites that were being blocked in Iran by offering a circumvention tool paid for with US taxpayer dollars through a service called Anonymizer, only available to those in Iran. But then the worry was, what if the Iranians use it to get to porn, at which point the American tax dollars are funding the porn habits of Iranians? That doesn't sound good. So they asked the anonymizer people to filter the tool that allows the circumvention of filtering, which um, the anonymizer people got up at the crack of noon <laughs> to kind of half-heartedly filter the tool that's supposed to unblock the filtering. And the result, um, which, uh, uh, yes, that's them announcing how great they are. But um, we then found that uh, they, what they did was they looked for certain keywords in the URL. So if ass appeared anywhere, you couldn't get there through the circumvention tool, which meant usembassy.state.gov was out. Breast was out, Bush was out, which was quite something. And uh, what's wrong with old? I mean, I know about Rule 34, but come on. <laughs> anyway, um, I love how soft was also not <laughs> permitted. So these are the kinds of things that um, got us in trouble with the US government and stopped our funding for quite a while from those quarters. But that's the price of good and solid research um, that was probably blocked by the anonymizer. Um, and of course, we also thought, we live in a distributed world, wouldn't it be nice if people, as they couldn't get somewhere, could report it, and then as the reports are coming in, kind of like Waze figures out where traffic is happening by the people driving themselves, if we could get to a sense of where the web itself is um, being blocked. And that started our Herdict project, which today is represented in our Internet Monitor Dashboard project, um, run by several people in the room, including Rebecca um, Haycock and uh, several others. And uh, this is about to go live this fall, which has a variety of ways of trying to measure the open web, which is just waiting to be measured. Now, nobody does measure it, which is weird. So we're like, all right, we'll do it. But it's there to be measured because it is a collective hallucination that anybody can crawl or scan. Unlike, say, the demographics of Facebook, which only Facebook knows. And if you try to crawl Facebook, you'll be in trouble with Facebook and no more Facebook for you. So to the extent that we're still an open web or open internet, to be able to get these demographics and have a pair of headlights uh, shining on where we're driving seems actually uh, quite important. It's the kind of thing just like even figuring out how many people are online you know, AT&T can tell you how many people are using their data plan right now, um, and Facebook can tell you how many members they have, but the internet can't tell you how many people they have, which is why when Wikipedia had one abusive 
user, so abusive that even Wikipedia's famed deep patience was exhausted, and they finally blocked the IP address of this vandal. It turned out to be the proxy IP address used by everyone in Qatar. And uh, the headline the next day was like, Wikipedia blocks all of Qatar from Wikipedia, <laughs> which was uh, unfortunate. Um, I think, Am uh, uh, sorry, uh, Samantha's going to find uh, this happening. Q-A-T-A-R. Oh, you're using the, yeah, there it is. <laughs> Wikipedia bans Qatar. Home to nearly a million people has been blocked from any, due to a large volume of spin. This is similar to the time that uh, at the Berkman Center we got an email from Macedonia once, the country of Macedonia, <laughs> saying that um, so much spam had originated from there that many internet routers were just ignoring all bits from Macedonia. So they're like, if you get this message, help. <laughs> and <laughs> it's like one of those things of like, huh. And again, there's like nobody they can call to just like, Remove the block. It's just, everybody hates you, Macedonia. I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's sad. That's very sad. So um, we digress. Um, there's also a, now a network of centers that Berkman is uh, spearheading uh, that we're trying to get around the world who study this stuff and will be able to compare notes and work from where they are uh, on these kinds of questions. So what's our next interval? What are we doing? Uh, there's a ton of different projects going on. You saw a bunch of them next door at uh, the science fair. I hope you signed up uh, for information on uh, at least one of them. And it's hard to figure out an organizing theme. We are a bottom-up organization, so we're not that much into like five-year plans and this is what we will be growing in the terrarium. But uh, my own assessment of what we kind of tend to look at these days, subject to change, are the three Ps, platforms, privacy, and public discourse. Privacy kind of comes in and out of focus for us over the years. Lately, both with government surveillance and a lot of the stuff courtesy of the Snowden leaks uh, has new focus on that. And we have a project going in which we take current senior NSA officials and lock them in a room with the likes of Bruce Schneier, um, famed crypto anarchist and uh, fellow board member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and just watch to see what happens. <laughs> so like, you know, pizza goes in one end, and a really interesting position paper comes out the other end of the room. <laughs> and so that alone is uh, worth the price of admission. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, corporate privacy practices and some of the new uses of big data uh, that are going on. Platforms, of course, are the intermediaries that more and more stand to govern our lives. And I don't know if post-2002 in the Microsoft case, we would have thought that there would be, for every major online functionality we perceive today, one primary offerer of it. That's very unweb-like. Didn't have to be that way, but maybe it's the kind of thing that has a natural monopoly with network effects. So studying those platforms and relating to them is a big part of what many of our projects do. And finally, public discourse. Uh, Charlie uh, was fond of saying very early on, and still does, that the internet is a rhetorical space, and it's a space of discourse of various kinds. And figuring out how that discourse gets shaped, and what you can be able to accomplish online, and the double-edged nature of it, the, the fact that abuse can happen online to individuals and basically drive them out of spaces, uh, I think is these days recognized at least as much of a problem as traditional government-based censorship of people wanting to get a message out against great dissent. And all three of these you'll find represented, I think, in various projects. For my own part, I've been really interested in such things as this experiment from 2010 in which Facebook wanted to see if they could get uh, a statistically significant number of people out to the polls by just including in your news feed that little banner at the top that says, it's election day. Click here if you voted, and here are some of your friends who did vote. And uh, it turned out a statistically significant increase in the number of voters who went out happened, leading to the hypothetical of, well, what if they just showed that to Republicans or Democrats, depending on whom you don't like, and uh, just showed it to them and didn't show it to others? Would you be wronging the people to whom you did not show that, uh, uh, that notice? And you might be changing the outcome of the election. Is that just regular old electioneering, or is that something evil, an abuse of a platform that's supposed to be your friend, not supposed to be electing the person the platform wants to see elected by directing you to the polls or not, depending on what they think you're going to do? And let's be clear, they have a good sense of what you're going to do. Uh, if you take a look, this wonderful study that shows that during the 100 days before a relationship starts, Facebook observes a slow but steady increase in the number of timeline posts shared between the future couple. Facebook knows you're going to date before you do. 
And you could see a wonderful service offered to future parents-in-law, giving them a preview of the relationship and asking if they'd like Facebook to send them off to vote instead, <laughs> rather than allowing that to gel. Um, privacy, platforms, public discourse, all three represented in this kinds of stuff. And it's also, to me, a great issue of the future of academia. It used to be that academia had the economies of scale, the government funding, the interest in questions that don't have immediate commercial impact, that this is where really interesting, enduring, if non-commercial questions were asked and answered. This is a really interesting question. We can't run this study without Facebook. Facebook can run this study without us. If you are a freshly minted data scientist, where would you like to be spending your time? At uh, Facebook or here? That's a tough question. If you do it at Facebook, you might be hurting America. But if you <laughs> helping your career, and if you do it here, you might be helping America, but not having the data to go. I kid only a little uh, on that front. Uh, this wonderful experiment <laughs> with a terrible BuzzFeed-like title. I love how the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences itself engages in A-B-tested clickbait. Experimental <laughs> evidence of massive scale emotional contagion. If you read this article, it's like The Ring or something. Um, <laughs> But this example, which boils down to like some social science research, and now I'm just throwing out chum to my social science colleagues, if you get happy posts in, your posts out are happy. And if you get sad posts in, you tend to share sad stuff. Who knew? Well, this proves that. And uh, that then led to a histrionic reaction of how many people have committed suicide as a result of this very experiment, giving them sad posts to see what they, in turn, um, do out. Yes, so there's uh, all of this. Yes, Facebook. Oops, getting along with others is the essence of getting ahead successfully. <laughs> Thank you, William Feather. Um, so Facebook manipulated user news. So these kinds of things from this, uh, uh, this guy saying how terrible it was. This is, again, a great time to be on the cusp between academia and the industries that are the platforms that we're engaging with day in and day out. And how to deal with this is a, a problem that we haven't figured out yet. Let's jump back to the uh, deck, because I want to make sure to leave time for uh, some questions and such. Um, so let me talk just a little bit about the modalities through which a place like the Berkman Center, and we're unique, goes about the work that it does. Because we are not defined by a methodological uh, uh, orthodoxy. We started at this law school, but we're university-wide. Among our fellows and affiliates are a huge range of disciplines, including non-academics and practitioners. And uh, so here are some of the things that do tend to draw a line through all of the work that goes on. Um, one is, as exemplified by Yochai Benkler's book on the wealth of networks, a, a particular interest in uh, distributed and cooperative approaches, the kinds of approaches that got the internet and the web going to begin with. Uh, these approaches might be very helpful and often overlooked to solve the problems. Often when we see a problem online, whether it's online abuse or spam or DDoSing, you name it, it's where's the sheriff? Who can we find that can actually lower the boom? But figuring out how to collectively uh, and through lots of individuals who alone can't do anything but together can, those sorts of approaches tend to animate a number of our projects still as a hypothesis, not as a conclusion. It might turn out that in instances it doesn't work, but these are, tend to be underexplored solutions. The other kind of approach that you'll see among our projects a lot are that we swing for the fences. We go for the A plus or the C more than we do the B or B plus. If we're doing something that's like you read the thing or you experience the website and you're like, that's yeah, pretty good, that's bad for us. We want reactions that are like, wow, I never thought of that, and then it might be followed by, that's really cool, or what a total waste of taxpayer dollars. We'll go for that bimodal distribution over the merely adequate kind of, yeah, all right, I'm glad somebody's doing that. And uh, that's the sort of work that we, we aim for. And I think on a related note, um, I don't know if this is still true. It might be that the city of Austin has become a caricature of itself, and probably all of you are going to South by Southwest next spring. Um, but uh, there is this sense of keep Austin weird, and I think there's a sense of keep Berkman weird as well, that we're in one of the more uh, uh, sort of 
big in the public eye universities with the crimson and the mahogany and, and a very big endowment and stuff like that. And I think we look at it as a chance to um, go off-roading a lot uh, rather than constantly worrying about risking our reputation and such, that the reputation is there to be risked rather than to be um, just sort of doing the expected uh, thing. And I think that animates a lot of the Berkman Center's way of looking at things. Um, this was actually, I think, from uh, Nate Matias, one of our uh, returning fellows. I don't know if he's here. Um, but Nate did a guide to being a Berkman Fellow, for which this played prominently. And um, I hope everybody sleeps well tonight. Um, so it is kind of this character's welcome sort of uh, feel to it, but not in a uh, contrived way, I'd like to think. And I can't help but say, for the character's welcome motto, uh, there's this wonderful Yahoo Answers. Remember Yahoo Answers thread? What does character's welcome mean when they advertise it? I hear this every time, and I'm just curious as to what this means. So the best answer was, that's their slogan. It's in reference to their TV shows. For example, Monk is a character. The guys from Psych are characters, etc. Can't argue with that. <laughs> I give this answer a B plus. So, which therefore makes it the best answer. So our goal as a center, as a convening place, is to satisfy the lower layers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs so that each of you can do the great work that you have within you, that you're not sweating the small stuff, that you're having a community of people with whom you can share an idea, that you might have no idea but be willing and interested We'll have then the calendar of events that even as busy students or practitioners or wherever else you may be hailing from, there'll be a chance to go to something that gets you thinking and maybe changes the way you think or gives you an opportunity to change the way others think. And creating this is the kind of thing that requires a ton of work that people like Becca Tabaski and Dan Jones and Urs uh, and um, so many others, Suze Kriegsman, engage in uh, day in and day out at the Berkman Center so that that substrate is there for great and weird and um, momentous things to grow. And that's basically uh, what we're about. So those are the sorts of dispositions that try to drive our work. We realize life is short. There's a lot of things any of us could be doing. We want to be spending our time doing stuff that matters and is new. And we hope uh, that you'll be joining us uh, in that venture. So with that, let me just say welcome, and then we'll open it up interactively. But thank you very much. And thank you, Sam. Get ready to drive. All right. Uh, questions, comments. And for those running out, there's food next door. I don't know why I'm privileging you, since you should stay before you eat it. But I think there is food next door. Um, Anybody want to react? Say something. Ask something. Introduce him or herself. I've got a question for you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to uh, give this to Michelle. Citrin, but I've got a question for you. Go for it, Charlie Nesson, our founder. How did you get to be so smart? <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, our arrangement. <laughs> <laughs> There's no trick to it. It's just a simple trick. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so sign up today for our five-point plan on increasing your internet smarts. Uh, <laughs> but really, Charlie, it's all thanks to you. <laughs> the tiger is mollified. <laughs> Michelle. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation. I really like the sort of historical approach you, you took. I just wanted to ask you, uh, to, to what extent do you think the core principles of the internet back at the time, like end-to-end -end principle, open-endedness, and uh, decentralization are still true today. And do you think they will uh, be sustainable in the near future? Oh, that's the 64 um, euro question. And uh, I guess I would say, like so many of these questions, I find myself torn in two directions. So here's what's going in one direction. The internet has so much inertial momentum to it, it can't even upgrade itself from IP version 4 to IP version 6. Don't ask what happened to IP version 5. And that's amazing. That's amazing that it's going so strong and is so flexible and generative that even obvious improvements to how it would work are really hard to implement because people are still pretty much satisfied and hung up upon uh, V1, as it were, or in this case, V4. So uh, there's that. 
And for the web to still be going strong today, for things still to be advertised with URLs and dub, 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 dot, like, that's pretty cool. Um, I don't know how we explain that toward the next generation, like why you're typing dots and crap, but um, very cool. Now, pulling in the other direction is the world of the app and the world of shiny gizmos that you click on something and it happens. And of course, the more it happens, it's like, well, what am I defending? You all should have to use keyboards and type shit. Like, that doesn't make sense. But the more and more we rely, as is happening, on a Siri, on a Cortana, on some advisor to shepherd us through, which will really just become our 24-7 concierge as you navigate the world and ask for informational help as you do it, that's feeding through a pipeline that may have found its way to you through the device that you bought or through a subscription that you entered into years ago but then ended up storing all your photos with or whatever that becomes very hard to abandon. And in fact, one of the biggest worries I've had about the um, distributed nature of the internet and web is basically the massive vacuum that Google has been applying to recent PhDs. They just all go work for Google and it means they can make a really good search engine and you know, Microsoft can hire a bunch of PhDs and try to make one that competes, and they're working on it. But in the meantime, the promise of a very rich data web, one in which anybody could write a search engine over the weekend and produce interesting results, starts to recede. So that's the stuff pointing in the other direction. And I don't know that there's ever going to be just like one big final battle uh, Lord of the Rings style to determine it, but a lot of little battles along the way and the kinds of stuff we try to do. Um, one example I, I mentioned just yesterday. Um, all right, Sam, I'm going to try to use your computer. This is dangerous. Let's see. All right, there we are. Um, so if, there we are. Uh, so let's go to amberlink.org, and there you will see uh, this is a production of the Berkman Center, and the idea is to allow any website that offers up links and might be itself subject to a denial of service or other attack or blockage to have its links mirrored by other websites that normally point into it but only point into it, don't cache the content. This would allow those websites to cache content for one another so that you can actually have a rich distributed web of stuff rather than a brittle app that if the app goes down, it's all over, or trying to host every website at Amazon, whatever website it is. That's an example of trying in a very small way to fight part of the battle to keep a substrate for a free and open internet going. Um, yep. Feel free to tell us who you are. Will Zachman. Hello, Will Zachman. How are you doing? Fellow CompuServe Sysop from back in the day. We're, we're, we're a long way from Canopus, Toto. <laughs> yeah. Um, you said something earlier that uh, you didn't really, you sort of alluded to something that I didn't quite know what you were saying. You said that uh, who would have thought after the Microsoft suit, so many years later, there would only be one provider each for something. And I didn't quite get what your reference was. I'm curious to know what you had in mind. So what I had in mind was in 2015, and let me be clear, America, if you are microblogging, you're using Twitter. Like, I don't know. This is a weird group. How many are using Identica to emote? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Maybe you can make some friends today. I, you know, <laughs> right, exactly. As the Simpsons say, the first fax machine is really just a waffle iron with a telephone attached. You need other people to do it. So if you're microblogging, how many people are on Twitter? OK, that's, that's a market that's hard to contest. If you are engaging in friendly relations with others, friending them and following their, their updates in longer than 140 characters, um, how many of you are on Facebook? OK. How many of you are on what's something that's Facebook but not? Oh, I love it. It's like a game show or something. 200 for, what's that one called uh, that the NYU students did? Diaspora. diaspora. How many are diasporans? Excellent. Maybe you guys can have a party at the reception and talk about using diaspora, which I'm sure you're all plugged into right now. Uh, but wait, somebody else was shouting something really confidently. Live journal? Live journal? Any live journalers among us? 
all right, that's a community. And that's actually a community for which if everybody else joined LiveJournal, you guys would be like, that's terrible. LiveJournal's gone straight to hell. So <laughs> there's great to have sort of a federated system of stuff. But talk about Zipf's law, a uh, power law of like 99% of the people are on 1% of the sites that offer the functionality. LinkedIn? Well, I'll sleep better at night knowing I've got LinkedIn as my backup to Facebook. <laughs> I, I just got to say, this is terrible because I know we're streaming and this is being recorded forever. I can't stand LinkedIn. <laughs> Thank you. If, you. if nothing else comes out of this meeting, let's storm LinkedIn headquarters and tell them we want to remove a connection and we don't know how. <laughs> Much less removing two at once. Like, so... It's got quite a bit of use, though. It does have a lot of use. And, 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 An interesting phenomenon I'm noticing lately is that a lot of uh, young people graduating from college or that are getting to be seniors in college yes. are moving off Facebook to LinkedIn because they think LinkedIn is much better for them in their careers than Facebook. I love how they just leapt frogged right from MySpace into LinkedIn. Well, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they didn't. They yes. went from MySpace to Facebook, yes. but a lot of them are moving to LinkedIn. And it does lead to the platform's question of, is it meet the new boss same as the old boss? I mean, to what extent is the kind of competition what you will would recognize as CompuServe versus AOL versus Delphi versus oh, yeah. Prodigy? There's so much choice among these staid services that sell you stuff at 10 cents a minute. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, I want to just ask, are there others who want to weigh in on this, and particularly by reference to maybe introducing a project? But I, there might just be a question here. Go ahead, Becca, if you want to find the mic. No, yeah. No, no, I'm CRCF, so I, I can wait for all Oh, Kimia. Hi. Tell us about the Center for Research on Computation and Society Does at else? the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, <laughs> otherwise known as Circus Seas. Exactly. Yes. There is never a room with this many Berkmans in, inside unless you're here. So I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I just wanted to introduce you guys. <laughs> you're going to let me finish. but Yes, yeah. yes. Um, um. <laughs> I can't believe I just um, likened myself to Taylor uh, Swift. To That's stand-up. just not good. <laughs> um, so we host, CRCS hosts postdocs uh, and faculty members that are largely computer scientists. Um, but we host these computer, computer scientists that work in a variety of different fields um, and contribute to a lot of different fields uh, through their interdisciplinary work. Um, so I feel like you know they have a lot of in common with Bertha Berkman Center, and there's a lot of synergy there. So we would like to invite all of you guys to come to our open house tomorrow. We'll go over some of the projects that we have at CRCS um, and the goals that we have for the year. It's going to be at 5 o'clock tomorrow in the Harvard School lawn. Um, and we also have a symposium coming up in two weeks. Um, it's, called, uh, it's called Societal Impact Through Computing Research. Um, so please, I, if I have not spammed you already, feel free to contact me. Uh, my name is Kimia Mavon. If you Google me, I'll come up. Uh, it's not very private. Um, and then we also have... <laughs> Boy, that careened into depression really quickly. <laughs> yes. We also have bi-weekly seminars, and on the off weeks of that, we host uh, informal discussions, talking about things that are going on in the news and media, and how technology can use, be used to solve those problems. Um, so definitely Berkman kind of... Sorry, Berkman kind of minds are the kind of minds we would like at these meetings and these events. Um, so please, uh, again, Kimia Mavon and CRCS... Dot C's dot Harvard dot edu. Thank you, Kimia. That's very well timed. Why don't you just hand, uh, hand it either forward to Willow or back to Dave Talbot? I just as a sort of, I'm cold calling. I know you didn't raise your hand. Uh, Willow's looking panicked, so pass it to Dave Talbot. Hey everybody, my na- Dave, just tell us about your project. Well, I'm glad you, you gave me this, uh, this introduction because uh, I had a small issue earlier and I wasn't at my table uh, as, as uh, diligently as I should have been. So if any of you are interested in local government and uh, community broadband, municipal fiber efforts. We're trying to catalyze efforts here in the state of Massachusetts, educate cities and towns about what they can do, why they should do it, why they can uh, save money for the municipality, aid economic development. And um, I'll make myself available tomorrow at 10 a.m. and give you guys a personal briefing 
uh, to make up for my earlier lapse. So there, I've, I've admitted my humiliating moment earlier, and that's I wanted you all to share that moment. Um, Not anyway. all Berkman Fellows and Affiliates are as self-flagellating, but we <laughs> welcome it. We and uh, Try to set the bar high. W where should people go at 10 a.m.? Uh, uh, at the Berkman Center in the, in the kitchen, and I'll be there for you. In the too. kitchen <laughs> at 23 up, Everett, where there will be hors d'oeuvres at, uh, yeah. at 10 a.m. I will Let make coffee for you. Just let, send me an email, say how you like your coffee. And, um, <laughs> But it's a new project this, uh, that was started this year. Very excited about it. We have a case study out. We have a lot of projects we want to do in the next academic year. And it's a real important issue for, for uh, communities in Massachusetts and beyond. And David, somebody who's been a writer and editor at Technology Review, MIT's uh, uh, very extremely well-regarded magazine. For how long, David? Oh, several, 14 years. OK, so he's been yeah. reviewing technology for yeah. quite a long time. And now, as Mark Twain would say, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody ever does anything exactly. about it. Now you're doing something about it. And it was a thing of beauty to see in the room where we just had the science fair. Uh, David gathered about 50 folks from around the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who run uh, municipal power uh, entities. These are co-ops for the most part. And uh, to have them thinking about how they might be delivering broadband. And it was just fascinating to see them thinking in a new way about what they're doing. And they don't do that very often. They don't get together to learn from each other. And so that's what we're trying to do. Yes. And I don't know, Susan, I, should I cold call you, Susan, Professor Susan Crawford, uh, either to talk about this effort or any other that you want to talk about? Well, it's great to hear Dave talk, talk about team fiber, because yep. the country, we are to Norway as Cuba is to us. We have a long way to go. That's going to take a long time to unpack. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, so I'm Susan Crawford. I'm a new professor here, and I'm delighted to be in the room and to see all the energetic, twinkling faces around this place is great. And uh, if you're interested in local government, in uh, use of fiber around the world, in stories about how government is trying to do its job better using technology and engage with citizens, uh, I'd love to talk to you. And I, I'm sort of a Berkman project, because without Jonathan Zittrain, I would not be here. And I'm very grateful oh. to him. And without Thank Susan, you. I would not be here. <laughs> People are like, are we clapping? Are we not clapping? <laughs> it's totally optional. Uh, OK, uh, just time for maybe just a couple more uh, questions or interjections or uh, announcements of stuff. Yes. Hello. Hi, I'm Barry Schein. Um, back around 1986, when I was in charge of most of Boston University's network, we put two 10 megabit dishes between here at William James at Harvard yes. and BU. And we formed the mailing list with MIT, BU, and Harvard. And the first question that was asked was, how are we going to control them? In other words, if one of my students misbehaves, I know what to do. If one of your students misbehaves on my network, we yes. have no process for this. Yes. We don't have no paperwork. Yes. Or in 1989, three or four years later, when I began allowing the public on the internet for the first time, OK, the first thing Steve Wolf asked me over the National Science Foundation was, how are we going to control them? Okay, what are you going to do if they misbehave? Yes. I mean, it's astounding. I mean, because you said that towards the end of your talk. Yeah. And it's astounding how this has been a, a constant theme of how are we going to control them? Yeah. And yet somehow we have very little control over them, and, and it marches on, right, yes. without us. <laughs> and I, so I happily agree as a. 30 years. Right. But also see how much in, say, the past two years, that irony that you note, or, or just observation, that it's like, how do we control this, when it's like, it pretty much controls itself, reminiscent of John Perry Barlow's Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, written in 1996 uh, after a bender at Davos. Um, <laughs> And uh, this thing is as lyrical as it gets. Um, and that's fair, since he's a lyricist. <laughs> Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You have no sovereignty where we gather, et cetera, et cetera. This is like a, a wonderful kind of Jeremiad. Um, but it's also something that has been sorely tested over the past two or three years, again, as we've seen people trying to go about their business and participate online and be griefed for it at whatever corner they turn. Now, if it's some part of like World of Warcraft, you can just play Zelda? I don't know. I 
behind what the kids are doing these days. Um, but if it's Twitter, you're not going to go play Identica. And uh, figuring out how to deal with that in a way that doesn't make you the parental foghorn and Charlie Brown who just wants the kids to stop being kids is a wonderful puzzle. And it's actually, I should just note, the EFF, which uh, uh, John Perry is one of the co-founders of, the EFF itself released a uh, report on social media and abuse. Let's see if Google, uh, uh, facing the challenge of online harassment. And this was a really interesting document for somebody like the Electronic Frontier Foundation to come up with because it is acknowledging some of the ways in which that irony has been complicated. And that's something for which uh, Bruce Schneier, Whitney Aaron Bosel, uh, and others uh, did a uh, workshop on that. And maybe, uh, Bruce, you want to say a couple words about that, actually. I, you're looking. So in June, we uh, brought uh, researchers. It was researchers. It was uh, people from companies, um, uh, activists, people from government to talk about misogyny on the internet. And it was really the first time all the different groups got together and had a serious discussion of problems, solutions, ways forward. And it's something uh, that's going to continue. Uh, a group was, was formed. The group's continuing online and, and we'll meet again. And I think this is a really big move forward because th these divergent groups often just don't talk. Yes. And this is just a way of saying that we are, I think, quite proudly and self-consciously, a big tent. There's not a whole lot of ideological baggage that you have to uh, pledge allegiance to in order to participate in the Berkman Center activities. And in fact, it's in the disagreements that we often thrive the most. Even in the Eldred case I was talking about, Arthur Miller, not the playwright, um, but the law professor, um, <laughs> wrote a brief on the other side as to why we were totally wrong, and sadly, uh, his brief uh, prevailed. Willow, you're going to say something. Sure. And one of the things that keeps coming out in the, the workshop that we had, and also one of the projects that I've been working on, kind of weaponized social, is that the tactics that we hate other people using are also the tactics that we use, where suddenly we are able to hear anyone on the internet using a term that we don't like, whether they're on our side or the other side. And... I have really enjoyed that at the Berkman Center we have not said, well, that one tactic is not okay or whatever else, but we continue to complicate the matter and make sure that the people who are being shouted down still have a chance to speak um, and yes. that the idea to respond to negative speech is not censorship but more speech. Yes, great. So uh, <laughs> with that applause, um, <laughs> let me invoke the zero with rule of uh, Berkman Center um, uh, operations, which is we should never turn a meeting into a hostage crisis. So um, I think we're going to bring this in for a landing. Thank you all very much uh, for coming out. Thank you.